Hi, Paul. Hi there. How are you going, Sam and Lee? Ah, great. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thanks for joining us on Mod Lounge to talk about disruption. Uh, we're so pleased to have you here to talk about your work. Um, perhaps to, uh, to provide a bit of context, can you tell us a little bit more about your area of interest, VR and learning design, and how you came about into this area? Yeah, there, look, there's a story behind it. I, I, you mentioned in the bio that um, we're, you know, extensively in rural and remote Aboriginal communities as an edu educator, and particularly late 90s and 2000s, I, I guess you know, the schools we were working in uh, actually had access to technologies. We wanted to explore the idea how we integrate technologies into learning design to um, to engage our, our learners, you know, and our community uh, in that adventure. And so there's kind of a, that background story has sort of influenced the kind of work that we do in STEM. Uh, and, and essentially where VR sort of fits into the picture, it, we, we, we've sort of ex we found a particular type of technology that allows um, users, uh, students and teachers to create their own virtual tours. And we thought that this is a great platform to engage learners as naturally competent and curious uh, and, and capable because what we're doing here is allowing them to actually tell a quite an in-depth story and draw on their cultural assets and their funds of knowledge. So VR for us was a kind of a no-brainer tool to go to because it had such a rich platform to offer, I suppose, co-construction of knowledge and processes and thinking and, and, and the way that students and teachers and communities can actually articulate you know, a meaningful story about who they are and where they are and what they do. And so VR sort of enabled us to do that but we needed to get a, a VR tool that enabled them to be able to work with that and create that story and then share it. And, and I guess the learning design part is about, well, you know, in education, how do we use the technology in a way that not only drives the learning and engages the learning, but produces, you know, a bit more, more meaning. And, and today, I guess we're talking about this idea of disruption. And if I just sort of go to one side of the, the story here is that, you know, for too long, I guess we've had this discourse of deficit about particularly Aboriginal students, you know, and that significant majority that may be encapsulated in, in very narrow metrics about what they can or cannot do. And, you know, learning design sort of speaks to the idea that we can produce, you know, from learners' cultural funds of knowledge, you know, really rich products. And not only that, it disrupt that, that deficit of discourse and stereotype that's associated with it. And there's some fantastic things happening in VR across the country that are just bringing out those really amazing results in communities where we have high engagement. We have engagement not only just at the school level, but through the community and being, a, you know, a technology that smart, it's, it's something that everyone can actually access, you know, with permissions. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, with this research, what do you think the most challenging aspect is for you? Right, yeah, well, there's a number. Um, reaching out to schools is, is one thing. And, and obviously, um, with this particular project, you have to be extremely sensitive around how you connect and how you put your foot in the door very gently and you knock and you, you want to ask people their permission and approval to do this because there's going to be questions about why you're going to do this and it's research. And so there's, there's got to be some real care and respect shown in this space. Um, so that's not possibly an, an obstacle, but that's a necessity that we have to, to deal with. Essentially, I guess, coming into the nuts and bolts of what schools do, and essentially where our research is pitched, and particularly at middle schooling, in, in where students are aged between, say, 12 and 17, um, the next thing we need to consider is, from just a school functional point of view, is that do schools have the time to actually take on a project like this? And often PD or professional learning is, is sort of punched into one day spaces where you get a bit of this and you get a bit of that and someone then takes it up. And so a challenge in this project, this is not a one day event. This is something that has to have some concerted effort. And in this research project, what we propose to do is actually visit the site a number of times, first of all, to introduce the technologies and where it's used and why and what are the benefits and, and give people a bit of a try at it. And then the second thing is to get that technical competency happening. And then the third thing is let's build that project and get that happening. And, and so this is something that's gonna take, you know, 15 hours at the minimum 
the good news is we've actually run this sort of workshop series. You know, we did that last year and we engaged over 500 students at the smart school. And so we've got a kind of a template that we think works and we've had that buying from, from schools. And, you know, and when you work with secondary teachers too, they not often get the chance to actually work together. And when we talk about STEM, it's hard sometimes to bring all those particular teachers together. And we're not just talking about the science teachers and the DNT teachers and the math teachers. You know, STEM is something that we know is actually incorporates the X factor as well, which means you you go right across the curriculum and but you you certainly showcase some of those, you know, thinking skills, computational thinking and so on. That's all important. But essentially, you know, those challenge are, first of all, we, we need to get in schools and do something that's, you know, a concerted and consolidated approach. That's really important. And the next thing you do, you've got to build those relationships with teachers and staff, and you've got to be in there for the long journey to build a really, really great product. And, and we've, we've got a sense of proof of that now. And so we're really excited to actually have an opportunity to, to take what we've learned in the last year and take it out to some other schools and actually do the research which digs deep, not only into what teachers understand and how they change their practice, which is really important in this model of disruption, but it's also about giving students a sense of, you know, this is what we've produced and it's innately about us. And it's actually really deadly because it actually has got all this other knowledge in it as well. So you combine your Western knowledge in your Australian curriculum with those cultural funds of knowledge, you know, and we want to find out and tell the story too, but you know, how VR, because it's such an immersive environment, uh, allows for more sensory stimulation, increased sort of cognitive cognition uh, through a range of sort of um, problem solving and um, spatial reasoning sort of subsets, I guess. Uh, but essentially, we want to capture this idea. This, when you build a project like this, it's about... I know Paul is just uh, setting the automatic lights back on. Well done, Paul. That was very smooth. Yeah, yeah, click. Um, so I was sort of, sort of saying, you, when you build a project like this, you naturally get into higher order thinking. And this is something that, you know, we have a curriculum model that sort of tends to be at this level of thinking. What, what this project does is actually stimulate the learners, and that's the teachers as well as the students and community, into building something substantial, which means they have to synthesise, they have to design a storyboard, they have to look at all the elements and the parts, and that's going to mean that their brains are moving into all sorts of new dimensions of organisation and spatial reasoning and communication. This is good stuff, you know, and this is the stuff that we can do and, um, and that's what we want to go out and prove and, and sort of say and look look what these fantastic students as capable learners can do and that's a different story and hopefully that really is part of a range of um, research that we're doing at the university in this space and principally led by you know Professor Irabena Rigney and, and that's looking towards how we move towards a cultural um, responsive pedagogy in our schools and this is just one of those projects that adds to that and if we get that critical mass then you know that's what that disruption is all about. It's such an amazing area hearing you talk about it is very inspiring and um, but I, I note that you have said there is kind of scant evidence of studies uh, to investigate mm. uh, VR's educational merit um, uh, within that design and creation context and also I think there's a kind of a a legacy hangover that say anyone 20 years or older uh, might have in terms of how they see a screen or technology we've kind of grown up with a very passive um, audience uh, kind of introduction to technology uh, but I think anyone 15 years or younger probably has grown up with a very kind of active um, and engaged uh, relationship to screen and technology. So perhaps you could talk around those issues a little bit for us. Okay, all right. you talk. You definitely got the digital natives aspect of it right. Most of our students are, and and they're they're very very confident. And look, you know, out in the field, you know, teachers who are older are becoming more confident, you know, and, and to where they need to be. And then schools are structured where other specialisations need to happen. Um, but you know, essentially here, I, I guess. Um, one of the affordance of the screen, uh, and this is based on a lot of work like Maya, for example, and it's this sort of dual recognition that you have text and you have imagery working together. And the old adage, you know, a picture paints a thousand words, it's, it's been proven. I mean, the brain works 60,000 times faster, apparently, when we mix up 
text and images together and it, it creates more meaning. And so this platform, this is kind of very sort of, you know, if you speak to Stephen's work, which is about, you know, the connected society and the internet of everything, this, this whole idea of knowledge is abundant, but it's not only abundant, it becomes more powerful when you combine it spatially, visually, and with text embedded. And we're noticing that there are, you know, other groups around the world, for example, that have grown up not in a text rich environment, um, and, and they are going to a leap that sort of goes from that second order of you know, having to know text to be literate in society to this new version of, which was very much 20th century, 21st century now, but they skip that kind of level by saying, we can get meaning from the, the pictures and the story and the infer inferences from that. And so I, I don't know if I'm asking you, answering the question correctly, but I'm trying to sort of build that story around the text and the image and the fact that we use screens and, and multimedia uh, more and more in our learning to make meaning and sense of things. And that's an important part of what we aim to do in this project is to dig down into, you know, is it about um, making sense through this medium? Is it about making sense through itself and other? And how does the digital world sort of configure into all of that? Yeah, yeah no, that's it. It sounds exciting and it sounds like, yeah, that people that might not have had access uh, to being able to communicate because um, because of the written language barrier, perhaps, um, can now actually, uh, they're able to communicate uh, through these other mediums. Um, what, do you, what do you feel like is um, the, the, the key question that we should be asking um, going forward in this field? Look, a key question is, and I think you mentioned it from the, you know, a while back, if I get my my brain sort of working back into a little spot that sort of says, you know, um, there's been limited research done in this space. And particularly from um, VR um, applications that are creator applications where you can create your own tools. There's plenty of gallery objects out there and you can have a look at the solar system through VR. You can take a ride in a balloon. But this is stuff about where you create and design your own story. And so this needs to be investigated and we need to build a case of evidence around it to say, well, these are the benefits from it that we suspect and these are the, what we found out and we want to find out a bit more. And that's, that's just pushing that envelope around how you use smart technology with multimedia to create sense and meaning uh, and how you actually then as locators, creators, communicators of that and sharers of it, how, how that sort of sits in, you know, in terms of that digital literacy. Uh, and particularly in the higher order aspect of that, when we look at you know, ourselves as digital citizens, you know, we want to try and have a sort of moral story out there uh, and we want to be able to tell a story that I suppose, um, you know, it's got ethical value um, and, you know, great common good about it and it's got to solve some problem uh, and I guess that's 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 where these sorts of technologies when used for purpose can really sort of push the envelope into, into how we make sense of things and how we consider the values in things as well and then and, and how we actually might then resolve some of the particular issues that we have in our world and we've got quite a few on at the moment. Yeah for sure and um and it sounds like the the, the content is uh, and how we treat the content uh, is a uh, is an important factor. Um, we're just getting a question through uh, from the audience, um, and this I think you'll be very well uh, state stated to talk on this. It talks about um, uh, do you see some barriers in making the technology available to students who might be in remote areas? Or uh, and uh, how can we bring this um, to more students in an affordable way? Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, um, good, great question. Uh, certainly, there's been this issue of the digital divide and those people, particularly further away from the so-called centre. I mean, when you're in remote, we think Adelaide or Sydney's remote doesn't really. So it's a really interesting sense of perspective that that's there. But essentially, bringing resources to remote bringing VR to remote is not at the moment extremely um, sort of cost heavy. You know, there's headsets, there's existing infrastructure that you can plug into. And we're actually developing through our own university, a creator version of this technology, which we're gonna use in this research. And that will be made available to those schools pretty much at, at you know, at base cost. Um, there are other providers out there and it can be expensive, but essentially, what this research project might do is actually form cases of evidence. Will they will then buy government goodwill and you know some some policy kind of recognition that this needs to be rolled out. And if that's the case, you know the way the way that we're thinking about building this particular technology is that it has to have rollout scalability 
sort of built into it. And so we'd love to see the technology be used in, you know, just about every school, or we, which we could, but there's going to be a stage and sequence to that. So in terms of the answering the question, at the moment, yeah, it is sort of cost prohibitive. Um, and, you know, you have to sort of look for particular opportunities where, you know, providers such as universities or others can come to you at, at the right kind of cost and for the right reasons, of course. But eventually we'll build up that critical mass of cases and we would expect if this, you know, prove, proves the value and, and that certainly has the impact for the disruption that we're aiming for, then sure, we should be able to, there should be no question about, well, why not? Well, we should be able to roll this out and there should be ways to actually um, make that scalable and manageable for schools. And we'd love to see it. And look, a lot of the remote schools, you know, um, have really interesting programs, you know, on it. You know, just, just um, for example, you know, Google the Pilbara and the amazing stories that came out of VR through there. This is some great stories. So a lot of remote communities are doing wonderful things, you know, in their schools. And uh, it, it's just a hope that we hope that this particular technology is one that we come pretty much off the shelf in the next two or three years. That's so interesting because I had my first kind of modern VR experience um, last year during, uh, well, this year actually, during Adelaide Fringe. Um, and I was so surprised how compact it's become because in my head I still have, you know, Star Trek holodeck. Like that's what I think of when it comes to VR. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's, it's, yeah, it was literally just a computer and a headset and you could go into a completely different world. So like keeping like cost prohibitive is, is obviously a really big barrier, but do you think there's anything else that's actually stopping VR from being used more widely at this point? Um, a lot of teachers or, you know, a lot of schools can sort of pick up any technology with a be a 3D printer or VR technology and to put a tick in a box and say, we've got the technology and now we're, you know, we're STEM smart. Um, it's got to come back to the whole idea of how, how it's put in learning design. And so, as, as I mentioned before, you know, the teaching professional development is, is a really key aspect in what we do. And essentially we do that with both teachers and students. And it's not about teachers watching us work with the students and, and showing them how to do it. Uh -uh. You know, it's about actually sitting down with teachers and doing the planning design with them and going, all right, and, and you're, you know, we're a team and your role will be. And sure, you know, some of the teachers feel very anxious about, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm capable to ever handle this stuff. And yet we sit them down with their, their students, particularly in secondary school, and, you know, we do some reverse rolling so that the, the students... That's another little auto <laughs> automatic light dance. Smart school um, <laughs> and, and saving power. Um, and so you get this kind of beautiful role reversal of, of the learner teaching the teacher and teacher, you know, uh, with the learner. And, and that's really powerful. And, um, you know, we, we don't we don't make an issue of that. And essentially, through our course and our PD, we make sure you know, that the learners themselves, including the teachers, make sure for themselves that they become fully enabled on their project. They become they own the project. You know, we just give them the guidance and um, I, the scaffolds that they need to be able to produce their projects. And so, you know, in terms of the barriers, it's the, 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 the kind of thing that it will, will, will uh, probably, you know, um, not, not allow a reform like this to sort of to be, be, be realised is the fact that if we just give them the technology and a, and a running sheet and a video and says, well, go and do it for yourselves, guys. You know, um, I think in this case, it's just too important that, that we actually need we need this, this contact and we, we can do things remote as well, but we need that kind of partnership and that relationship to, to drive that professional learning. And that's what we saw last year and that's what gave us great results. And so schools, you know, definitely have to make that kind of commitment, I think, coming forward. If this is something they really want to do, then they sort of need to embrace a model which is going to be more sustainable and put the, put the commitment right up there. Um, and now we have a, a question for the audience related to that. It's they saying, do you think this could see digital natives leading flipped classrooms for teachers? And could this be the future of learning? Oh, look, um, most definitely, I think we have a balance of that. You know, one of, one of the great things that I learn every day with the, the students I work with, that they teach me lots of stuff and, uh, and that's great. And while I have lots of stuff that I can contribute to, you know, I see that we're on a very equal playing field. Um, 
and that yeah the flip learning and the design uh, work that students can do I think should be totally totally valued um, and you know that would be a great initiative to see more of that particularly since we've had this COVID interruption and it's going to probably stick with us long we certainly have now um, been able to reimagine or at least redefine you know those 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 knowledge assets that are out there and knowing that we do have you know information everywhere but we also need to be careful and mindful of which information is usable and how we're going to use that and make those decisions around it so you still need you know you still need those sort of teachers and tutor type sort of figures but I think there's certainly a lot more that can be done in terms of how you be innovative and flexible in terms of how you you know put up a learning design that that builds what, what you've just said yeah that's so true as well um and so in this I don't know, pandemic disruption that we're living in. How do you think it's going to play out over the next few months? And is there anything in particular we should be thinking about post COVID-19 interruption? Oh, look, you know, in terms of the pros, I think the, the, the pluses here is certainly that we are engaging more with um, these sorts of platforms and digital technologies. The, the cons come is that we, come up with, you know, many of our students and our tutors at uni, this is not just speaking to a university perspective, um, we get very saturated with, with this medium. So we have to look, we have to, you know, really examine what's been going on so that we, we get a better balance of, of, of how we use these particular mediums and platforms. Post COVID, I think, um, I think it's going to be ongoing at the moment. And so, you know, I'm a firm believer in emergence and from a very positive kind of view of what emergence means. And I guess that is where you have local solutions and you get critical mass and you get some good ideas and you get things that, you know, actually make a pathway forward. It's not because it's been scripted at the top. It's those local interactions and connections at local levels, uh, as you've just spoken about, you know, having you know, students have input to these sorts of um, design work. You know, that that's, I think that's what's, that's emerging, uh, and, I, and I think that's going to be probably be a great asset for our, our university as a learning community to embrace it. You know, take take on the ecosystem and, and build pro a proper, you know, complex ecosystem where everyone's sort of working and, and having their inputs. And I think that's 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 certainly going to build a fantastic out result, uh, COVID or not. <laughs> yeah, it's really going to be, um, I don't know, it's something I'm interested in. So I'm really going to be interested to see what's happening next. Um, and considering what's happening what what's next for you yeah look uh, well field work um is what we want to do uh we can't do that at the moment because uh, a lot of these communities are going to be in lockdown for some time um and we acknowledge that so in the meantime we're sort of now sort of retuning what we're doing with um our vr sort of uh, engineer mob um and we're thinking about making some work examples. So the idea that we're thinking about is a bit of a plan B and working with local Aboriginal people here uh, as elders and, and also maybe Tanjana or some of these sort of places if they're open for, for being receptive. And we build some worked examples about this is what a storyboard could look like. And we, we have a bit of a video doc that sort of goes with that. So that we've got something to take out to schools and sort of say, well, you know, this is how the mob here did it in, in Adelaide. You know, and this is some ideas in terms of design work and how we might do it with you guys. And so, you know, that's 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 what we're thinking about there because we want to use our time valuably, and we've got we've got a product that we're developing, and we've got to get some sort of um, some kind of example up that that's going to be useful. Um, and then going forward, obviously, it's very very much about um, doing the field work and exploring the cases and building the cases, and and getting um, proof, I suppose, of what we're doing is 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 disruptive in the most positive way. Uh, and then let's just, let's look to the bigger picture and make it more scalable. For sure. Um, it sounds like you're very, very busy. Uh, and so I hasten to ask, is there anything else that you're working on or exploring at the moment? Uh, look, um, I, I have a bit of a fascination with complexity and it comes up in my leadership course. And so we're just thinking how wonderful, you know, because we've got the technology, we do have, you know, the, the right amount of inputs now and data sets. How, how great it would be to build a complexity modeling sort of device that would mean that you feed so many more inputs in it that would give you more more metrics or just more data about you know what school environments are really doing and, and often school environments are kind of you know being driven by policy drivers that are me measuring quite narrow things and looking at the market marketing of schools and their results but a lot of schools you know in other areas in fact all schools 
they do incredible work. And if for leaders, if they could actually have a tool that actually takes polls and takes the analytics and gets all the feed and bytes back from web, website traffic and all the analytics that are out there, as, as well as feed in some relational kinds of attributes, you're going to build a tool that's actually going to say, we agree on that and we don't agree on here. And so let's have the conversation about where we go forward. And so it's going to improve that whole idea of emergence in terms of, you know, putting together through conversation, where's the agreement and where's the certainty and how do we build these things? You know, do we have to be this kind of school or is this what our education stands for? We've got some standardised drivers that we know we have to adhere to. But, you know, we're in the 21st century as well um, and there's different ways that we can think about teaching and learning and, um, and what results mean and what the purpose of, you know, education is all about and push some of those boundaries. So that's, that sounds that's great. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a, a radical, in the best kind of way, a radical uh, solution to a, a tricky conversation to have. Um, yeah. If people are interested in finding out more uh, about what you're doing, where where would you suggest that we look? Okay, well, at the moment, well, we did have a great website up, but we've got to sort of fix, fix something's gone wrong a little bit there, which we explored earlier before the show. But essentially, look, um, you know, the, the best place is to contact um, the smart school here uh, or myself through an email address um, and be happy to um, explore any any kinds of um, questions or you know conversations that people might have but essentially but as the research project builds we'll, we'll build a space where people can actually engage in that um, and it'll be a digital space so we'll get on top of that once we get a bit more data in and we get that project sort of more towards its, its completion stages um, maybe towards the end of this year, but certainly next year will be probably that, that sort of time. But yeah, I'd love to, to hear what people are thinking and, and what they're saying. It'd be great. Yeah, it sounds uh, exciting. And, um, and I think it would be great to perhaps have you back uh, a little bit later in the, in the year or at some point, maybe with some of the students or some of the students' work that's coming out of this, this program. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be, that'd be absolutely fantastic. We'd love to do that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Paul. We've really appreciated you coming on to the program this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Oh, Thanks, thank Paul. You. All right. All right. <laughs>